Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the history of BBC Micro Typing Games. This is a special episode focused on one of the Bee's most productive developers, Peter Scott. Pictures of him are unfortunately few and far between, but here's a grainy one taken from a 1990 edition of the Micro User. Based in the northeast of England, Scott was responsible for programming more than 20 games for the BBC Micro and Electron. His early output was predominantly single or flick screen platform games, often with an adventure element. Well-known titles included Hunky Dory, Last of the Free and Thunderstruck, and several of these games had a very similar visual style that became something of a trademark for Scott's early games. By sheer random coincidence, I reviewed a collection of three of those games on Witchfinder's Gaming Vault very recently, so please check that video out if you want to see some examples of his early work. From 1988 onwards, the majority of Scott's work was done for superior software under the pseudonym Dylan. He was responsible for converting several big name titles from other systems, including Barbarian, The Last Ninja and perhaps most impressively, Sim City. Before all of that though, Peter Scott began his coding career by writing several typing games that were published in a variety of magazines in 1984, and no surprise, that's what I'll be looking at in this video. I've got four magazines to look at, each containing a game written by Scott, and unlike my normal videos in this series, I won't be looking at much else in the mag since this episode is really all about those games. First up in this episode is issue number 51 of Personal Computer News. This one's dated March the 3rd 1984 and this is a weekly magazine that I have featured once or twice before in this series and it's got a cover price of 50 pence and for that you get 84 pages of content. The cover feature this time around is Sharp's PC5000. Is this the cutting edge of portable technology the magazine asks? And I'd say based on current technology, no it's not. But it might have been back then. The most notable thing mentioned on the cover in the context of this video though is Acorn Arcade, a racy millipede game for the Electron and BBC and that's what I'm going to be looking at in this magazine. Before that though, let's take a quick look at the contents page and see if there's anything else that stands out. If you want to take a look at this magazine in more detail you can of course click on the link in the pinned comment and browse it yourself on archive.org. The main articles that stand out are Microdrive Magic which allows you to put your microdrives to good use with Gavin Monk's indexing and database program. The cover story about Sharp's high powered portable, a competition that allowed 5 Epson RX80s to be won, probably a bit late to enter that now. And for BBC Micro owners there's an article entitled Acorn Interfacing. What would IEEE Interfacing mean to your BBC Micro and how do you get it anyway? Victor O'Neill looks at two solutions from Acorn and CST. There's also some game reviews for the Spectrum, Atari and TI-99 4A. I'm sure some of those articles could have been interesting, but this is a predominantly games focused channel, so let's stay on topic and move on to the games listing. Flicking through the magazine to get to that though, I noticed this advert for the Emacs Arcade Professional, built to take a lot of stick. This is an advert for an arcade quality joystick that costs $28.95, VAT included, and it says warning this panel is a professional module, it is not a toy, and goes on to say now you have the power to destroy the joystick cheap and nasties with the new super joystick which it claims is compatible with the VIC-20, Commodore 64, Atari, BBC Micro Model B and Spectrum. The artwork here is quite amusing as you can see a mustachioed gentleman in the cockpit of a space fighter using this joystick to fend off lesser quality models such as the Quickshot 2 and Competition Pro. There's an artist's impression of the unit in the flash here, but I did manage to find a photo of the real thing online which I'll put up on screen now. It claims to have genuine two-handed control with total quadrant accuracy, whatever that is, and a two, four or eight-way gate interchange. It does look like a pretty impressive piece of kit and could probably be considered as a precursor to the USB arcade sticks that are commonplace these days. No more distractions then, time to move on to the games listing which is on page 61 of this magazine and as we've already seen from the front cover the game is called Millipede or to give it its full title, Morris the Millipede. Just as when I looked at this magazine previously, the presentation of the game listings in personal computer news is really nice. You get a screenshot in the top right corner which quite obviously shows you that it's a snake style game and there's also some comical cartoony artwork to represent the game as well. And in this case you can see a big nosed smiling millipede with Wellington boots on every single leg. That must have cost him quite a bit. The introductory paragraph says Millipede is a fast arcade style game written for the Acorn Electron by Peter Scott of Bedlington, Northumberland. Since it was written on the Electron, it will also run on both the BBC Model B or Expanded Model A at a higher speed to boot. It then goes on to give an overview of the game which I'll cover later on when we look at the in-game instructions but you can probably guess how to play it anyway to be honest. In a closing paragraph of the introduction, the author gives the following hints on getting a good score. Only press a key when you want to change direction as the Millipede keeps going regardless. Start on level 9 and graduate up through the skill levels as you get better. Don't take too many risks, especially towards the end of the screen, as you get bonus points depending on the length you've attained. The listing then begins and it spans a whopping 5 pages interspersed with adverts, many of which continue the comical artwork seen on the first page. 
Particularly amusing on the final page is the image of the millipede exploding with Wellington boots and teeth flying all over the place. The listing itself is only 180 lines and you can tell that because unlike most BBC micro listings whose line numbers increment in multiples of 10, Peter Scott's listing begins at line number 1 and increments sequentially leaving no gaps between the line numbers. 180 lines isn't that big for a listing anyway but actually there's lots of lines that can be omitted because there's quite a lot of REM statements during this one where Peter explains what each section of code is doing. The listing is also printed in a large readable text size which would have made this one pretty easy to type in. As well as the REM statements, most of the pages also feature a section on the left hand side that explains what the lines are doing in more detail. For example on this page you can see that it says that line 100 starts the game, line 106 is when all your lives are up, 107 rubs out the screen, 110 to 131 relate to the high score table and so on. There isn't really anything particularly innovative or clever about this listing, it's a fairly straightforward basic game. And because it's so well annotated by both the programmer and the magazine, I'm not going to dig into it any further, but I have to say, if you're looking for a really well documented example of a BBC basic game, then this is one you should definitely take a look at in more detail. For now though, let's leave the magazine and take a look at the end product. As is customary for most BBC micro typing games, this one begins with some instructions, which are pretty unremarkable in terms of how they look, but they do give a brief description of how to play the game along with the controls. And the instructions say you control Morris the Millipede who is trapped inside a grid. Morris is rather hungry and you must steer him away from the multicoloured obstacles and to the green food diamonds. Hit an obstacle or the sides of the screen or Morris and Morris is vaporised. I think that's basically saying that you shouldn't crash into yourself. It then goes on to say occasionally a yellow cross may appear which can be eaten for bonus points. When time runs out you move to the next harder screen. You have three lives and can earn a bonus life if you manage to pass the fifth screen. It's then got the keyboard controls which are the BBC Micro standard of Z and X for left and right and asterisk and question mark for up and down. You can also pause with the space bar and press escape to restart. You then also get some options, firstly choosing whether you want sound or not and then the skill level of 1 to 9 where 1 is the hardest. And the skill level just dictates how fast the millipede moves. Once you've selected those options you can press any key to start the game and once you do it should come as no surprise that this is basically a variant of Snake. You move your millipede around the grid collecting the green diamonds with black centres, not to be confused with the yellow diamonds with red centres which will kill you. Each diamond you collect will extend the millipede by one segment. As well as avoiding the obstacles on the playfield, you must also be careful not to crash into the walls and of course your own tail. Occasionally yellow crosses will appear on the screen and if you collect these you get more points, but also the length of the millipede extends by several segments. At the top of the screen you'll see your score, lives and level number, and also a red time bar that gradually decreases. When the timer runs out you complete the level, moving on to the next one which features more obstacles. This may just be a snake clone, but it definitely has the feel of a Jeff Minter game with the grid layout, noisy sound effects and chunky vibrant graphics. The colourful flashing effect between levels also reminded me of the arcade classic Robotron, which Jeff is known to be a big fan of. I guess Peter Scott was too. There's only so much you can say about this type of game, but this version is done well. The controls are responsive, which is vitally important as you try to collect the food and avoid the obstacles. It can be quite hard to distinguish between those two items in the heat of the action, so it's possibly safer just to collect the crosses, especially as these give a better score. With the only requirement to complete a level being survival until the timer runs out, it's possible just to go around in circles in a clear area if you just want to last till the next stage, assuming the middle feed's short enough. If you want as high a score as possible though, you'll have to take more risks. Presentation wise, the game's great, with an informative status bar at the top of the screen, a choice of options on the title screen and a high score table to record your achievements. When all said and done, it is just a snake clone, but a very polished and challenging one. It would benefit from more variety in collectibles or adding new challenges on later stages, but it's a perfectly playable game as it is. In a 2007 interview on the Acorn centric Stairway to Hell website, Scott said that he received £500 for this game which allowed him to replace his Electron with a BBC Micro. The game's therefore significant for enabling Scott to invest in a computer that allows him to develop his many other games, so he should be grateful for that. If you're enjoying this video and would like to support my channel then why not become a member? For a monthly fee starting from just 99 pence you can get access to special membership perks such as your name in the supporters hall of fame on every video, early access to most of my content, member only polls and even choosing games for me to play in future videos. If you're interested then please click on the join button below this video for more information. 
Alternatively, if you're not able to commit to a monthly contribution but would still like to support my efforts, then you could give a super thanks. This one-off donation gives you a highlighted comment on whichever video you choose to click the button on, and anyone doing this will also get a shout out from me on a subsequent video. Again, you can find the super thanks button below this video. You can also help raise the profile of this channel by liking this video and leaving a comment, which helps improve my ranking in the mysterious YouTube algorithm. Any support you can give, financial or otherwise, is greatly appreciated. Let's move on to the second magazine in this episode then, and you'll have seen this one before because this is a June 1984 edition of Games Computing, and I already featured this back in episode 10 when I looked at a game called Rocket Man. The game I'm going to be looking at this time though is featured on the cover, and there's a lot of alliteration here as it says Addictive Arcade Action in Android Antics for the BBC. And the game is represented in a rather abstract fashion, with lots of objects flying around, and this robot in the middle, which is vaguely R2D2 influenced, with its cylindrical body, dome shaped head, and two legs, although it does also feature a cannon on that dome. Having taken an in depth look at this magazine in a previous episode, I don't need to bother this time around, so I'm going to jump straight to the games listing, which coincidentally, just like in the previous magazine I looked at, is on page 61. Confusingly, in the top right hand corner, it says this runs on the Oric 48K and Atmos, which is a complete lie because this is a BBC Micro and Electron game. The artwork from the front cover is reprinted in black and white, and in the box out on the left hand side, it says in this game you control a roving robot that is trapped in some haunted mines, and whose only means of escaping is to collect all the keys lying scattered around the cavern, kill all the aliens which endlessly pursue him, and return to the door at the top right of the screen. After that there's a long paragraph with more information about how to play the game, and following that is details about the program listing. It says when entering the program, replace all pound signs with hash signs. The game was written for maximum speed and includes a machine code routine to move the aliens, as in basic this would be very slow. To speed up the detection of objects on the screen, the use of GoSub is employed, and to maximise the speed of GoTos, the program is numbered from 0 onwards in increments of 1, and REM statements have been omitted to save on the limited memory. So you can already tell this is going to be a more complex program than Morris the Millipede, with the helpful REM statements from that list in omitted to save memory. It does retain Peter Scott's seemingly preferred line numbering format though, and I wasn't previously aware that go-tos could be speeded up by reducing the increment between line numbers. Anyway, the introduction rounds things off by saying the result of these measures and the use of many multi-statement lines is a very fast and challenging arcade quality game, and at the very bottom it says next month watch out for the continuing saga of the roving robot in Alien Roving Robot 2. And you've probably already worked out that that's what I'm going to be looking at next. This listing might be lacking REM statements, but there's no shortage of information here, as this rundown section that starts on the first page continues onto the following one, with a comprehensive overview of what almost every single line is doing. There's also a separate section on this one called the Machine Code Rundown, which gives a summary of what each machine code instruction is doing too. And if that wasn't enough, there's also details of what every single variable in the program is doing as well, so you certainly can't say you weren't informed. As for the listing, that starts on page 62, and is then concluded on the following page and a half, with a final line count of just over 200. The text size isn't quite as generous as the listing in Personal Computer News, but it's still easy enough to read and quite clearly laid out. Again, I'm not going to be picking out anything specific, most of it's just the usual basic instructions that we've seen in many listings before, but I suppose it's worth taking a look at the machine code section because that's a little bit less familiar. That runs from line 172 where proc assemble is defined, and there are roughly 25 lines of machine code in total. This is definitely not my area, but there are some commands that clearly stand out, such as dot left, dot right, dot down, dot up and dot hit. I can't begin to tell you what any of the instructions on those lines actually do though, so let's move on and take a look at the game now. Just like Morris the Millipede, the game begins with some instructions and they look very similar to the first game. I imagine Peter Scott just sensibly reused the same code in this game as he did in the first one. You can see that the title of the game is actually Roving Robot, and I have no idea why some of these magazines decided to change the name of the game when they printed it, but didn't go as far as changing it in the actual listing. Anyway, the instructions begin by repeating what I've already mentioned from the introductory box art from the mag, but go on to say the robot is equipped with a jetpack and a laser which can only fire sideways, there's debris lying around the mine which can be collected for bonus points, but avoid the dead aliens and floating balloons. You can collect the diamonds and fruit. And it also says that you gain a life for passing level 5, which again was the same as Morris the Millipede. I wonder if that's going to become a standard for these games. The controls are listed, and then you get the option of whether you want sound or not, and once you've made that decision, you can press any key to start the game. This is a frantic platform collector map where you must pick up all the keys and eliminate all the enemies before the bonus runs out, and it counts down pretty quickly. It's a simple and repetitive concept, just getting harder as the levels progress by adding more enemies and objects that kill you. The graphics are quite basic, with a limited colour scheme, but the design of the main character is an early glimpse of what was to come with Peter Scott's games. Bug-eyed robots have become a staple of many of his early titles, and while this version is primitive, you can see the origins of Scott's design ideas here. 
Aside from that, the enemies and collectibles are all pretty simple single character objects and the platforms are unremarkable. One nice graphical effect is your robot's laser, which is also pretty efficient as it goes through platforms so you can shoot enemies on the opposite side of the screen. The sound effects in the game are varied, and while the noise of the laser collecting items and eliminating enemies are all decent, the grating sound of your robot activating its jetpack is something I could do without. Speaking of that, vertical movement of the roving robot is pretty jerky, and it can be easy to crash into things you didn't mean to, though control does get easier the more you play. Shooting enemies and collecting the keys is easy enough, but the big challenge is to do it before the bonus expires once the first few levels have been completed. It is possible to exploit the expiring bonus if you're willing to risk losing a life, as if you only have a couple of objects left to collect, you can do so after losing a life and finish the level with a large bonus. To prevent that scenario, the bonus should probably be proportional to how many objects you have left to collect after restarting, but to be fair, you can only use that trick a few times before running out of lives. It's a bit of a shame that the layout of platforms is the same on every screen, as that does make it a little bit boring as you go from one level to the next, so it would be nice if that changed as the levels progressed. Perhaps that would be one way to enhance the game, as would adding different types of enemies, such as one that homes in on you. The aliens do have some kind of basic AI, but they're not really hard to avoid. The game's presentation is very similar to Morris the Millipede, with the same instructions screen as you've seen, and also a very similar high score table. The status panel at the top of the screen is also similar and shows a good if it ain't broke don't fix it approach from Scott with these typing games. I can't agree that the game is arcade quality as the magazine claimed, but it is a step up from the Millipede game in terms of originality and does show that Scott had good understanding of how to create an arcade game with an increasing difficulty level and optional secondary collectibles. It's most noteworthy though for beginning to define the visual style of endearing robot characters, which will be carried forward into many of Scott's later games. Let's move on to the third Peter Scott typing game, and you know exactly where this is coming from. Here's a July 1984 issue of Games Computing, and as you can see, the robot from the cover of the previous issue is back, this time accompanied by a chicken and some eggs, with the caption, Go smash an egg with Ambling Android and a BBC. Again, as I've seen in several of these Games Computing magazines, the artwork on the front cover really makes it stand out. I haven't looked at this one before, so let's take a quick look at the contents page and see what else this magazine had on offer. And once again it's crammed with typing listings for a variety of different computers, including Planet Lander for the Auric, Snail Trail and Triple Chance for the VIC-20, Frogling and Soprance a lot for the Texas Instruments, Driver and the Adventure of Pat the Postman for the Spectrum, two sections of software reviews, and no less than three games for the BBC Micro on this one, including House on the Misty Hill, Holmes and Moriarty, and of course Ambling Android. And once again it's on page 61, that's three magazines in a row that have had the listings started on the same page. Before looking at the listing, I'm quickly jumping to page 77 to take a look at this advert that stood out to me. This is for Pasta Blaster, or possibly Pasta Wars, for the Auric from Arcadia Software in Swansea. Never heard of this game before, but I do like that they're channeling a certain space fantasy movie saga in the marketing here. The Pasta Wars logo is very clearly influenced by the Star Wars one, and below it it says long, long ago in an Italian restaurant far away. There's then some text that I can barely read because it clashes with the background, but at the bottom there it says May the Source Be With You, and further down, it says watch out for number 2 in the trilogy, Ravioli Strikes Back. As I said, I've got absolutely no idea what this game was like, but the advert certainly stood out. I'll move on to the listing now then, and as you can see, it's got a very similar layout to the one in the previous magazine, but at least they got which systems it runs on right this time. Once again we've got a reprint of the artwork from the front cover, in grayscale, very dark grayscale this time, and a box out on the left hand side with an introduction to the game. And that says if you enjoyed playing Roving Robot last month, we have another dose of the same. But they didn't call it Roving Robot in the last magazine, they called it Android Antics. Anyway, it says this time the faithful robot is now in charge of transporting eggs around a maze, of course the aliens are back to prevent him. It goes on to say this program uses machine code and makes full use of the BBC, and it will run on the Electron with no further changes. There's a brief overview of the game's structure and features, and the final paragraph retreads similar ground that the previous game did, saying the program was written for maximum speed and not for elegance or structure, going on to say that it uses multi-statement lines, go sub-variables, line numbers with increments of 1, and almost total use of integer variables. As with the previous game, we then get the rundown of the structure of the program, but it's a lot less detailed than the previous one, with sections sometimes covering blocks of 10 to 20 lines rather than individual ones. There is again a decent overview of all the variables used though, both in basic and machine code. 
Following that is the game listing of course, but again it's a little bit of a step down from the previous issue as the text size has been reduced and a 300 line game is crammed into just over two pages. On the upside though, REM statements are back in this one, giving the dual benefit of explaining what each section of code is doing and also giving you a bunch of lines that you don't actually need to type in. This time around the machine code section covers about 80 lines, but it's really neatly laid out with all the commands for each instruction kind of tabbed away from the line numbers. Once again I've got no intention of going in depth into this listing, so let's move on to looking at the game. Predictably we have some instructions which repeat the now familiar layout that we've seen in the previous two Peter Scott games, and again just as with Roving Robot we see that in game this one's got a different title. It's not Ambling Android as was described in the magazine, but it's actually Transport Android, and it's confirmed that this is Roving Robot 2. Just as with the previous two games, you get a brief backstory followed by the keyboard controls, and as in Roving Robot, you're able to choose whether to have sound effects or not. After making that all important decision, you can press any key to start. You then begin the game at the centre of a maze with six eggs at the top, which must be transported to the bottom of the screen one by one. Trying to stop you doing that is a small army of red aliens with yellow eyes, which are the first multicolour moving sprites to feature in one of Scott's games. A bonus starts counting down as soon as the level begins, and if you manage to relocate all six eggs, then any remaining bonus will be added to your score. You'll then move on to the next level, which is more of the same, but adding an extra enemy to make it more difficult. Transport Android has the same presentation as the previous games, with the instructions screen, high score table and status display all being reused, and it also retains the visual style of its predecessor, so it really does feel like a sequel. This time though, the colour scheme has been changed, moving to the red, yellow and cyan combo that became another trademark of Scott's early commercial games. This maze game is obviously Pac-Man influenced, and like that game, your robot does continue to move in the last direction you chose until it reaches a wall. That's something that a lot of these type-in maze games get wrong, so credit where it's due for achieving that. Unfortunately, the controls are very unreliable in this game, probably because the program just can't respond quickly enough to key presses. Sometimes you'll miss going through a gap you want to and get stuck against a wall, and with the maze being so cramped, it's rare when that doesn't result in an alien catching you. Those control issues contribute to a very hard game, which isn't helped by the fact that there are too many enemies on screen from the start. When a level begins you can get killed very quickly before you have a chance to react, and sometimes when it restarts you get killed by the same enemy. The difficulty curve would have been more bearable if the game had started with 3 or 4 enemies, and to be fair that should be an easy tweak to the game code if you wanted to do it. I had numerous attempts at the game but only ever managed to get to level 2, and soon lost patience with this one. The graphics are the best so far, and the way your robot changes colour when carrying an egg is a clever design decision, but I found the sound effects really annoying this time around. The concept is ok, though not particularly original, but this is the worst of the three games so far due to the unresponsive controls and high difficulty level. With it also being the longest listing so far at over 300 lines, this is the one I'd have been least happy to have typed in, though in fairness there may be scope for improving it. For the final game in this episode I'm moving to the September 1984 edition of Electron User, and I've not actually looked at a standalone edition of this magazine so far in this series, so I'm going to look at this one in a little bit more detail than the others. At this point the Electron had been on the market about a year, and database publications that were responsible for the micro user began the Electron User as a pullout in that magazine, before spinning it off as its own title from issue 5 onwards. It's got a cover price of £1, and for that you get 64 pages, which is quite a lot less than you get for the micro user for the same amount of money. I'm guessing a lot of those additional pages in the micro user are paid for by advertising though. This front cover has an interesting overhead cartoon view of an Electron user with a real Electron in front of him, and the two key things to pick out from this are firstly, Trapped in a Haunted House, play it if you dare, that's the game I'm going to be looking at in this magazine, and also in the top left corner here, all Electron user programs will work on BBC Micros with OS 1.2 and Basic 2, and that's why this game qualifies for this series, because it's playable on the Beeb as well as the Electron, just like all the other ones in this episode as it happens. There's no doubt that in the eyes of this publisher, the Electron was definitely aimed at a younger market than the more expensive BBC Micro. If you couldn't already tell that from the front cover, you definitely can from the contents page, which has a much less serious layout than the Micro user, with lots of little cartoons dotted amongst the list of articles. On the page after the contents is this interesting advert for the First Byte Electron Joystick Interface, and while this did stand out to me initially because of this image, which portrays the interface as some kind of intergalactic dreadnought and definitely takes influence from a number of movies. 
but when you look at the details below it's really quite intriguing. On the right hand side you can see the advanced design features and it says it works with all the Tori style 9 pin joysticks and utilises rapid fire mode on the quick shot too. That's quite fascinating because the BBC Micro was well known for its really terrible analogue joysticks so the idea of being able to use the joysticks that everyone else was using with the Electron would have been quite appealing. On the left hand side there's further information that makes it even more interesting because it says that to date 15 major software houses are already bringing out games that work directly with the interface and many more are sure to follow and it's actually provided with a conversion tape that allows you to use the joystick with many games that didn't have joystick support. Some of those mentioned include Killer Gorilla, Cybertron Mission, Chucky Egg and Daredevil Dennis. There's also a list of software houses that it claims are bringing out games that will work with the interface directly with no conversion tape needed and all the big name Acorn publishers are included including ANF, Program Power and Superior Software. There's no mention of how much the interface cost back in 1984 and I'm intrigued to know how well it actually worked. So if you were an Acorn Electron user back in the day and had one of these interfaces then let me know in the comments. Skipping just a couple of pages onto the news section there's an article on the left hand side here that caught my eye which isn't really directly to do with the Electron at all. The headline says contract ties BBC to Acorn for four years and the article says BBC Basic, the powerful language used on the Electron, has been given a huge boost with the announcement that Acorn computers have signed a contract with the BBC to continue to produce the BBC Micro for the next four years. They describe it as a blow to Sir Clive Sinclair's hopes of increasing his share of the educational market whilst it also ensures that the Electron's structured basic will be the educational standard for the foreseeable future. And there's a picture of Acorn founders Herman Hauser and Chris Curry signing the contract with Byron Parkin and Bill Cotton of the BBC. And since this series is essentially all about creating games, I suppose I should take a look at this news item on the following page, headline Software Aid for Games Writers. It says Electron users who would like to start writing games but are not highly skilled programmers can now get help from software. The authors, Yorkshire-based Holly Computers, say you still need to know a little basic to use their Game Maker 2 package. It's also handy if you've started to write your own games. According to the company, the package bridges the skill gap and allows basic programmers to convert their games ideas into action. And following that, there are several paragraphs explaining how it works. It's not something I'd ever heard of before, but it's certainly something I would have been interested in as a budding games designer back in the 80s. From the very front of the magazine, I've now moved to the very back, and this is the second to last page, and an advert from Superior Software, showing what games were available for the Acorn Electron at this point in time. It takes on a very similar structure to the company's BBC Micro ads for this period, with screenshots and descriptions for a number of games. Most of these just look like ports of the BBC versions, and we can see a number of arcade clones, including Percy Penguin, Mr. Wiz, Centibug, and Alien Dropout. For the more cerebral gamer, there's also a version of chess and a text adventure called Stranded, and just as a nod to the Acorn Electron's educational qualities, there's also information about world geography. So no surprise to see that Superior Software was supporting the Acorn Electron just as well as they were the BBC Micro. That gave you a small flavour of what Electron user was about, and as you could probably tell, it's very similar to the micro user, and I'll certainly be looking at more issues of this magazine in the future. Let's now move on to the games listing, which unfortunately doesn't complete the sequence of all the listings being on page 61 of the magazines I've looked at in this episode, because it's on page 32. As I mentioned earlier, the final game we're looking at in this episode is Haunted House, and the presentation of this one's really nice, with a large logo dripping blood, and a screenshot on the right hand side converted to monochrome. What's more interesting though is that the artwork that they've put here really closely resembles that screenshot. You can see the angled walls, the hero collecting keys and even the door on the left hand side just as you can see on the image of the game. The overview for this one says Haunted House is a fast and challenging arcade style game for the Electron and BBC Model B and unsurprisingly it was written by Peter Scott otherwise it wouldn't be featured in this episode. It goes on to say you take the part of a man trapped in a haunted room being constantly harassed by spooks, spectres and don't ask why aliens. To get out of the room, the man must collect all the keys lying scattered around the screen. At the same time, he has to get rid of all the nasties by shooting them with a laser. He can then escape by running to the door at the top left of the screen, and on the way he can gather various objects left around the room and collect bonus points, but avoid the ghosts and cans. Following a few more explanatory paragraphs, we then get a large box out that gives a thorough breakdown of the game, much like we've seen for the other games in this video, which makes me think that it was Peter Scott himself that provided all this information. There's a list of all the procedures and variables used and we can see here that once again we've got machine code because there's a list of the variables used in that section of code as well. And at the end there's also a section entitled speed up hints and if you read through these bullet points it all sounds very familiar. Use integer variables, use increments of 1 for line numbers, avoid lots of if then comparisons, use as few spaces as possible, avoid the use of VDU5 whenever necessary and use VDU codes instead of color G column print tab commands wherever feasible. Use go to and go sub variables instead of if thens and place subroutines at the beginning of the program to avoid searching through lines. We've seen much of that in the previous three listings and I guess you could look at this as Peter Scott's guide to efficient coding. 
If you've seen the issues of the micro user that I've looked at in previous episodes of this series, this layout will all look very familiar, and just like in the micro user, the actual listing starts much later in the magazine, this time on page 53. The listing is 269 lines and spans 3 pages, but boy is it going to be hard to read through this one because the text size is pretty small and is spanned across 4 columns per page, meaning almost every line of the program is spread across multiple lines in this listing. To make matters worse, there's no space between the line number and the commands on that line, although each line number is slightly indented. As those hints for speeding up the program suggested, there's only the bare minimum of spaces on every line, so this one's really challenging to read through. There are a few REM statements though, so at least you get an idea of what each section of code is doing. And to be honest, if you compare this one to the other listings we've looked at, it's very similar. All the procedures are declared up front, followed by a section of data statements and the printing of the instructions, and finally on the last page of the listing, you get the machine code routines, which this time span about 50 lines, and feature the same recognisable instructions as the previous listings, such as dot .left, dot .right, dot .down, dot .up, and so on. So having briefly scanned through the listing, I'm expecting this game to have a lot of similarities to the other ones, at least in terms of the overall presentation. So without further ado, let's check it out! It should come as absolutely no surprise that this game kicks off with a familiar looking instructions screen. It's very similar to the other three games with a couple of enhancements. Firstly, the name of the game is scrolling across the top of the screen, and also you can now see that under the keyboard controls, the options to switch the sound on and off have now been moved in-game, along with further options to pause and restart the game. Another minor change from the previous three games is that you now get an extra life when you get past level 4 rather than 5. And there's another surprise because when you press a key to start the game, a short tune plays. Upon starting the game we see the play area just as it was shown on the pages of the magazine. At first glance this might look like something similar to Attic Attack, with the design of the walls in the room being very similar to that game. In one of his interviews, Peter stated that many of his early games took on the look of an existing title that was popular on other systems, and he added his own game design to it, so perhaps it's not that surprising that it resembles the ultimate game. This is a different kind of game though, being more of a cross between a Robotron style arena shooter and a collector mob, as you must pick up all the keys and eliminate all the enemies. That's actually the same objective as in Roving Robot, and this game reuses some of the graphical assets from that one, including the baddies and the horizontally firing laser. The Skull and Crossbones death animation was also used in some of the other games we've looked at, as were the between stage visual effects. The soon to be famous colour scheme of red, cyan and yellow is back too. There are some new visual elements here though, such as the player sprite which is not very well drawn to be honest, and the surrounding wall of course which does look good. As you heard we also get some music for the first time in a Peter Scott game, with short tunes played at the start of the game and each time you lose a life. They're quite well implemented and there are some appropriate sound effects during the game too. I found this much easier than the other games I've looked at. The enemies are plentiful but quite slow moving and predictable, so they're easy to avoid and shoot. The controls are okay, perhaps a little bit sluggish, but the game isn't fast or challenging enough for that to be a problem like it was in Transport Android. Like the other games, there is a bonus countdown timer, which will cost you a life if it runs out, but that won't cause problems until quite far into the game and you can rack up a decent score on most of the early stages. I managed to get to level 8 and I think there was a bug because I couldn't leave the room when I had collected everything. Having got that far once, I didn't bother playing again to see if it happened every time. Haunted House is probably the best game I've looked at in this video in terms of look, and the sound is definitely best, but unfortunately it's quite boring after a few stages as nothing really changes other than the number of enemies and items to collect. I'd say this one is noteworthy for continuing those trademark colour choices and also for adding music and improved graphics. It's also retrospectively the earliest of Peter Scott's games to receive a commercial release, because in 1988 Alternative Software included it on their Triple Decker 2 release, along with two other games that began life as Electron user type-ins. I wonder if he ever received any royalties for that. That brings this special edition of the history of BBC Micro Typing Games to an end, and I think this was a fascinating look at the early games from a developer that went on to have great success on the BBC Micro. None of the games were really exceptional, but they showed that even when he was the archetypal bedroom coder, Peter Scott was thinking about the principles you need to follow to be a successful programmer. We saw examples of reusable code, a solid game engine, and consistent visual design that all became hallmarks of the commercial games he went on to develop. If I was going to pick a favourite from these, it would have to be Roving Robot for its influential look and arcade style design. If you're interested in looking at the listings in more detail or playing any of the four games, check out the pinned comment for links to them all. I've also included links to several interviews with Peter where he talks about these games and his later career in detail.
If you enjoyed this video then I'd appreciate you giving it a like and please leave a comment with any thoughts you have about the games or magazines covered. If you'd like to support what I do on this channel why not consider becoming a member? You can click the join button below the video for more information about the perks for each membership tier which start from just 99 pence a month. Next up in this series is another special where I'll be looking at four typing games inspired by a popular movie franchise from a galaxy far far away. If you know what I'm talking about then you should also know exactly when that video is going to go live. Until then please keep your eye on this channel for more retro gaming content, thanks very much for watching this video and I'll catch you in the next one.